Jason Hollander, our moderator, and uh, the yes. fact that his chair is there has to do with the smallness of the stage. It's nothing to say, nothing about it. status or anything. It's just the way it is. And uh, um, I wanted to welcome Dan uh, very much for coming here to uh, help the uh, man of peace be known more widely. And uh, I'm delighted that we can make the force for good a little expand its, uh, its audience. And Jason, welcome you, welcome you also to Tibet House to moderate us, to keep us a little, you and know, keep us in the going in the right direction. Just in case because you don't know, this is Robert Thurman. He's the <laughs> founder right. of Tibet House. That's right. So I'm uh, supposed to, I'm responsible. And I'm the nominal figurehead president. My wife actually runs the place and uh, my, uh, my many wonderful employees. So. And, and our topic is this book. The Man of Peace, which is a uh, story of the Dalai Lama that Bob has finished with uh, a team. Today, with two colleagues. I've been working on it for a few years. And this is our inspiration in some of our Tibet, uh, Tibet House course that we've operated every the last two years we've been operating. Since Dan did this as a birthday present for His Holiness, uh, chronicling all the wonderful things in a secular realm that uh, His Holiness has tried to sponsor, and Dan has actually been a major organizer and mover and shaker and all of that. So there's the force for good. So these are the two books that we're talking about. This is the sort of more recent one. This is the one that's been moving along for a while. OK? okay. All right. Should we get so now, bios? Jason, up to you. All up right. To you. I have a, few, a couple of bios, uh, coincidentally, of these two guys. So. Um, First of all, thank you all so much for coming. We're going to be doing um, questions at the end of this after they're, we're done up here. Um, so please start thinking of things you want to ask both of them. Uh, in the meantime, everyone hear me okay? Okay. In the meantime, I just want to tell you who, who we're talking to today. Um, seated right there is Dan Goldman, who's a former New York Times science writer. Um, he's best known for his ground groundbreaking bestseller, Emotional Intelligence, which has been printed in 40 languages across the world. And he's most recently, uh, he's co-author of the um, soon-to-be uh, debut, uh, alter, Altered Traits, Science Reveals How Meditation Changes Your Mind, Brain, and Body. Dr. Goldman spent two years in India, first as a Harvard pre-doctoral tra traveling fellow, and then again on a postdoctoral fellowship. And this research informed his first book, The Meditative Mind, The Varieties of Meditative Experience, Goldman has moderated several mind and life dialogues between the Dalai Lama and renowned scientists on topics including emotion, health, the environment, ethics, and interdependence. He is author of the 2015 work, A Force for Good, The Dalai Lama's Vision for Our World, which is right there, uh, and which was written for the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. Uh, Dr. Robert Thurman. In 1997, he was named one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential that Americans. Was, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. He is the professor of Indo-Tibetan Studies at Columbia University. He's president of Tibet House US. He's a popular lecturer on Tibetan Buddhism, the translator of many philosophical treatises and sutras, and author of numerous books, including the national bestseller, Inner Revolution, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Real Happiness, as well as Anger, which is the fifth book in, from a series on the seven deadly sins, uh, offered by the New York Public Library and Oxford University Press. His most recent book, which uh, we'll be talking about is Man of Peace, the illustrated life story of the Dalai Lama of Tibet. And it is absolutely beautiful. You have to look at it when this talk is over and you will want to buy it. Okay. Um, and I just want to give everyone a quick, a very quick overview of, of the institution of the Dalai Lama. I guess before we do that, let me quickly say, Jason himself is the director of communication at NYU. Right. And, um, he used to work at Columbia and then true. moved downtown. A long time ago. I moved and downtown. Uh, it's very kind of you to come and moderate. It's my pleasure. Honor. And I, I co-host a podcast called Meditate This Podcast, uh, which could be found on iTunes. If anyone oh, really? wants well, a semi-ridiculous take uh, on all this. We, we, we do our best to um, bring this to regular people, these conversations, and then we get to interview experts like these, which is pretty spectacular. <laughs> Um, but we want to just, we're talking today about the Dalai Lama primarily, and I want to just give a very, very quick overview for those who might not know. Uh, the first Dalai Lama was born in Tibet in 1391, and he, as well as each of his successors, is believed to be an incarnation of, and I apologize for the pronunciation, I'm from Long Island, so the, the cards <laughs> are stacked against me on this, um, Avalokitsavasara, 
I can have a look at this one. Okay, okay. <laughs> almost. Um, the bodhis, uh, bodhisattvas, uh, sorry, the bodhisattva who embodies the compassion of all Buddhas. The word Dali derives from the Mon Mongolian word for ocean, and Lama translates in Tibetan to guru or teacher. The current Dalai Lama, the 14th, is Tenzin Gyatso, who was born in 1935 and was selected for the title at the age of four. He fully assumed the role as head of Tibet's religious and political head of state in 1950, when he was just 15. Uh, however, in 1959, during the Tibet uprising, which actually, as we discussed earlier, wasn't quite an uprising, we'll explain that more later, um, against the People's Republic of China, the Dalai Lama was forced to flee Tibet, uh, Tibet's Potala Palace on horseback, disguised as one of his own guards. Uh, he trekked through the freezing cold Himalayas along treacherous slopes until finding sanctuary in India. Since then, he has, been, um, he has been a man without a country, but also a supreme force on both the spiritual and the scientific fronts in the pursuit of spreading compassion and consciousness across the planet. The Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1989. So uh, this is an extraordinary man we're talking about today, and you two know him in some ways as well as any American. Um, could you both describe the first time you became enamored with who the Dalai Lama is and then what it was like to actually meet him for the, in, in person? You want to start? Uh, well, my story is very brief. Uh, actually, Bob knows him much better than I do, and it was Bob, thank you, who introduced me to him uh, in uh, 1985 or 86 when he had came to visit uh, Amherst College. Back then, before he won the Nobel Prize, he was much more accessible. He didn't, hadn't become the rock star celebrity that he is today. And um, I, I was, I think, probably in awe of him from the moment I met him, probably before I met him, because I think all of us have this kind of optic about the Dalai Lama that um, it, there's kind of a glow around him. But then I experienced it. It actually is true. That there, I, I feel that at a certain energetic level, he emanates something, uh, a kind of peacefulness, but an energy. Maybe you could say something more about that. And you pick it up when you're with him. It's contagious. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're probably, I would say, I'm at my best when I'm around him because of him. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does it mean you feel most focused and your, your mind is I'm very clear? present, most focused, uh, kinder, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone else in your life who's ever made you feel that way? Well, I have to say my wife. <laughs> but <laughs> that's because I have to say <laughs> No, she's wonderful. But um, I, I, I was very fortunate uh, when I was in India for two years that I met a, a, a handful of remarkable beings, one of whom was uh, Neem Koli Baba, who was known as Maharaji Ramdas and made him famous as his guru. But he was, he was what uh, Tibetans might call a Mahasiddha. In fact, the Karmapa, 16th Karmapa, did call him a Mahasiddha, which means someone who's really awake and enlightened. And he. I experienced him in the same way as many others did. And I also have found many uh, uh, Tibetan teachers of the sort who are, who are called by a, a younger lama, the antique lamas, the ones who went through proper training in Tibet in the old days, have the same uh, potency, I would say. But I'd be interested to hear your view. Yes, well, it's, what is interesting is that um, Dan, uh, actually it was 1984 then. 84, the Amherst oh, that's right, that's right. And uh, when I introduced Dan to the Dalai Lama, and uh, Dan was absolutely essential to that conference on inner science. It was at Amherst College, I was teaching there in those days. And Dan has been the one who has most best introduced the Dalai Lama, all for now, since then, over 30 years, to all different scientists, and he published Destructive Emotions, I think you did, a bunch of different things, right? And you yeah. and I did a thing called Mind Science. That's right. It was published at MIT, actually. As exactly. Well. And so um, Dan has been absolutely close friend of His Holiness. He loves Dan. And in a way, he's been De the His Holiness's doorway to speak to the modern scientists, which is a, was a tremendous thing that His Holiness Th liked. That started in 84 when you introduced us because he said right away, uh, 
you know, I really want to meet scientists. Exactly. exactly. So then well, I, you're the one who brought everybody. Well, I was one of them. It was the Mind and Life group, Francisco yes. Varela, Adam Engel, and so on. Exactly. They convened a series of dialogues with His Holiness over the years, including one dialogue was just before he won, the day before he won the Nobel Prize. Yes, yeah, the one in California, Beach. Ron yeah. Yu, yes, I remember Yes, that. exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and of course, but uh, uh, Bob's actually underplaying his role. Because I think of all Westerners, you have the longest relationship yeah, 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 and the closest. Bit. Who are still alive. You know, I met him in 1964, really, personally, for the first time in India. And um, I, was, uh, he, I was his first American monk, which uh, I don't really like to talk about because I'm the, also his first American ex-monk. <laughs> because right. I, didn't, I didn't last that long. Um, our, my senior original teacher, an elderly Mongolian gentleman, brought me to the Dalai Lama and he told His Holiness, who at that time was only 28, I was 22, and uh, he told him, he said, uh, uh, he's a very nice American boy, he's a little crazy, very smart, but he speaks Tibetan already, and he's insisting on being a monk, but he, please don't make him a monk, Your Holiness, because he won't be staying as a monk, he, like that. But then he said, well, I'm just an old Mongolian, you decide. And then his holiness made me wait as a novice for, quite, for like eight months or something. But we became such good friends that he, and I was very sincere, and we were both too young. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since then, you know, I've been, uh, you know, more and more close to him. And at that time, we were kind of like fellow students together because he would remand me to his teachers about sort of Dharma questions, you know, and then we would talk about everything under the sun. I would think I was the second Westerner fluent in Tibetan who he could, you know, download my semblance of a Harvard education, a Philip Dexter education, whatever education I had about, I think I was not helpful to him and I couldn't tell him how to make a nuclear weapon. And <laughs> I didn't know that much about quantum the physics at the time. Stuff. I've learned a bit more since then, uh, thanks to his interest. But mm -hmm. But we talked about the humanities and psychology and Freud and the unconscious. I had to make up a lot of Tibetan words. It was a lot of fun. So we became great buddies, kind of. Then, in the, starting in the 70s, he sort of emerged as a great teacher himself of philosophy, Tibetan philosophy, which I studied with, studied with him. And he helped me a lot in my, around the time I was doing my dissertation on a very important Indian and Tibetan philosophical work. And then in the early, in the late 70s, early 80s, he emerged as a great sort of uh, tantric master, like meditation master. And um, then he really, since then he's really been kind of my guru as well as my friend. But one of the things that's great about his holiness, as Dan will say, is that he's very resilient in his personality. <coughs> and he can be very like a sort of a high and lofty, like a teacher in a certain setting. And then he's just totally ordinary and relaxed and very, 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 very That's nice. True. Actually, my wife gave the best analysis once we were asked by an Indian gentleman, had we ever seen the Dalai Lama perform a miracle? And I didn't know quite what to say. You know, there, there have been some funny happenings around the Dalai Lama. There are sometimes. But you're not supposed to really talk about them. And I was kind of like, well, I mean, why? She immediately says, oh, yes, all the time. <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> jumping like this. And then, uh, then he says, well, what were they? And he's leaning forward. And uh, she says, well, I, we've, we've arranged different visits of his over the years and been with him a lot of different times. And I've seen him in very stressed and busy situations, a lot of people wanting a piece of him. And I've never seen him with anybody not giving them his full attention and being concerned with what they want and need rather than like his agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's a miracle. <laughs> and <laughs> that's I thought it was really well done. Really but true. the Indian guy was so disappointed. Oh, <laughs> but he does, no, admit, he does admit that he had a, a rather short temper when he was young, right? Have you uh, seen yeah. him change and grow and evolve in the years yeah, you've yeah, known? Yeah, I think he, uh, he, can, he can still be a little grumpy, but as he says, it passes very quickly now. Right, right. And I think it always passes very quickly. He just would get a little hot about some idiocy that he would see, and uh, he, I don't think he was really too extreme about it, right. ever. No. But it's nice sure. that he says that. Yes. And he certainly has shown depth, as I said, over the years he has shown tremendous personal growth, and not just sitting there being on the Dalai Lama, but changing himself, the way he reacts to things, what he does. Mm -hmm. Really marvelous. Okay. Now, Dr. Goldman, in your book, you quoted uh, psychologist Paul Ekman as saying, I've never met anyone who is having such a good time <laughs> continually seeing the humorous side of nearly every situation. This is the Dalai Lama he's talking about. Um, but at the same time, 
we, we talk about the, the idea that the Dalai Lama never forgets for an instant about the suffering of his people. Uh, how does he function in both of those states, would well, you say? Well, I think the latter question I'll turn to Bob for, but let me give you my answer. To this. First of all, Paul Ekman is the world's expert on the facial expression of emotion. Uh, and he has developed a template, which is now even automated. Uh, it's computerized, where you can analyze the fine muscle movements of the face and catch even what he calls micro-emotions, which are uh, indicators of an emotional state like anger that the person doesn't want you to feel, or know you f that they feel, that they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to hide it. So he's like a dangerous guy because he knows how you really feel. Yeah. In fact, when I was, Paul Ekman was in the meeting on destructive emotions and once uh, we had a pre-meeting and I was walking with Paul and he was telling me about this um, method of analyzing micro emotions and, and I, we're getting to the room where the meeting is and I had this thought, oh, this is so interesting. I hope he wraps it up though because I have to think what I'm going to do in the meeting. Right then he said, and if someone had studied this, they'd know you're getting angry with me right now. <laughs> He's really dangerous. Anyway, Paul was, had a life-changing experience with His Holiness. Uh, and it was that uh, Paul had a miserable childhood and as a result uh, flared up in anger in ways that was very self-defeating for him. All his professional, he was notorious for, you talk about getting angry, he'd fly into a rage and it would end a working relationship. So uh, what happened was that during a break in the meeting, Paul's daughter wanted to meet the Dalai Lama, she was there. And so he brought her over in the tea break. He just sat there during the tea. And he took Paul's hand and he held it while he talked to Eve. And Paul said he felt this pulse of heat radiating through him. And after that, he didn't have an angry thought for about a year. It just totally <laughs> transformed him. But he also said that the Dalai Lama's face was the most amazing he had ever seen, because he's a student of faces. He said his face, first of all, uh, for, expresses the full range of human emotion. He says, every other face has learned to uh, not censor, but not to show certain emotions. He's, he's there for every feeling. And whenever he's with someone, he immediately reflects their feeling. That's that presence. Mm -hmm. and, but if it's very, if the person is in a negative mood, he drops it immediately. His baseline, his default range is, is a kind of joy. So then you have to juxtapose that because if you read Man of Peace, which I really recommend, you see that he has lived through horrors. I mean, tra things that would traumatize <coughs> anyone. And he also is, you know, feels the trauma of the ongoing trauma of the Tibetan people. And you wonder how can both those things coexist in one person? How can they? So, uh, yes, His Holiness, um, in the book, we had a kind of uh, uh, ongoing concern, I especially did, about showing the, the atrocities of the Chinese invasion and occupation of Tibet and the ongoing, I call it an ethnocide, which is a word I made up, but a Ethnic? ethnocide. Eth oh, an ethnic it's group. Instead of ethnic cleansing, I, yeah. I, think I like the word ethnocide, uh -huh. and uh, which they, are, they have been doing for 50, 60 years. And, um, and uh, well, who wants to stir it up type of thing? But we felt that uh, I, we, we've had a certain, we think, came up with the right balance, I think. Uh, and it's important because he's showing his development of peacefulness and his nonviolence and his compassionateness that he manifests to people is in the context of his extreme awareness of what his, uh, his people are going through. And uh, he once actually wept in a meeting with me and Nina and Ozzy Warner a few years ago, when the, they were, the ladies were saying that they wished he would talk more vigorously a little bit about Western politics. And there was a while when he was first coming to America where he kind of, was kind of unofficially let known, he was, uh, he was known like, please don't bring up anything political, a -political. Heard religiously. Right. So he wouldn't mention anything, but they were kind of encouraging to do it. And he actually cried. And he said that when he says in Europe or anywhere something about, oh, so-and-so got mistreated or such and such is a thing, he gets a back channel message that they just tortured like six people in this prison. Oh, is that, did that right. At the time, you know, he, he did, and that probably still. So we thought it was necessary to show the reality of what has happened with Tibet. And he also likes that, and he wants that to be shown. 
and yet then he wants to dialogue with them and he doesn't hate them and he, he considers them his teachers, even Mao and all of them, uh, even though they are doing, they have done a lot of harm to Tibet and they continue to do so. Uh, although he, and he, he thinks that, uh, you know, yes, I had an interview just a few days ago with Joe Donahue, that, this radio guy up in the Hudson Valley. And he told me that he interviewed his Holmes about seven, eight years ago, and he said, Your Holmes, what do you make of the fact that the Chinese are so aggressive against you, and although everybody in the world likes you, nobody really thinks that your sort of vision of society or history or politics is practical or something, and, 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 and what is it that, how do you react to that? So his Holmes said, wait. Uh -huh. So one word, <laughs> wait. That's right. And in, in fact, in, in Force for Good, where he outlines his vision for the yeah. world, uh, you know, he basically there's three parts. One, get your inner act together, practice, meditate, therapy, whatever works. Second, adopt an outlook of compassion. Mm -hmm. And third, act now in whatever way you can to make the world better. And he outlines three or four areas like, uh, you know, educating children or the environment or social justice, helping the needy, all of that. But he says, to my way of thinking, things are actually getting better. Even though the news today is grim, that's an imbalanced view of, of reality. Mm -hmm. And as a, you know, a reformed journalist, I have to say it's true because what makes the headlines of the New York Times is what's new and disturbing. And it happened to them, not to us. That's, that's one of the you know, gripping things about the news. Right. But if you looked, uh, as, as he points out, if you looked every day at all of the acts of cruelty in the world yes. and you balance them against all the acts of kindness and civility, the, the acts, all the good outweighs the bad by That's far. Right. And it, it's just not news. So he takes the long view. Yes. He says, this is a map for the next century. He says, I'm most interested in young people in, because it's them, the people of the 21st century who are going to be the generation that starts to fix things. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a long-term program. I have to say, he's a masterful strategist. Mm -hmm. He has uh, the okay. ability to think strategically in, in a long horizon. And there's a, uh, a Native American word for leader, which actually translates as one who thinks far into the future. Mm -hmm. And he's that kind of leader. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, just, he definitely is. And yeah. he keeps coming back, you know. That's, that's where it's a silly thing to pick him as an enemy because even you kill him, he'll pop up again. <laughs> 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 and although he's not going to pass, he promised uh, the Tibetan people publicly that he could make 113. He had some sort of inner knowledge. Is that right? And he insisted that he would, if necessary, although he didn't necessarily want to have to keep hauling it around that long. It's the cheaper rejuvenation is reincarnate, you know, then you get a nice new fresh body, you know, it's a, it's a lot of stem cells and things, and that's the cheapest, to find a nice mom, and that's a good way. Right. But he said he would stay that if necessary to work things out with his people, you know. And, uh, you know, we, should, we end the book, uh, this book, we end um, with uh, the current situation on the world, and we, this was even before the last November 8th, when we have come to realize it can even be rather grim here in America. Uh, but uh, this, this sort of the final moment here where his oracle is telling him like this, all these difficulties that are happening around him and the picture for Tibet is still very, very rough. And we show the, uh, about here I think we have, when we finished this page, was around 146 young Tibetans who have given their bodies to flames as a way of uh, showing their that you know it's just not worth this kind of conflict and they're going to move on to a new body you know and um, so this is a very rough scene but then we have an epilogue where we show his vision and he's still confident that things will work out for the planet and he has these four sources of hope that he outlines here which he used to say even before the current grim things that have been going on he used to say were a comparison between 1900 and 2000. That's why That's he right. said that the 21st century would be a century of peace, because it's no longer practical, all of the, the forces that made the 20th century such a violent, bloody century. The world religions, including taking secularism as a kind of, you know, secular humanism as a kind of religion, uh, getting together and not causing any conflict and violence, he has the second vision. And then Tibet being a healing center like the Switzerland of Asia, within a world system that has changed 
where people have recognized that war is no longer viable. It doesn't work, and also young people have finally got the petroleum industry to take a break, and they're all driving cheaper Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're managing all the solar power thing. It's actually already huge, actually, although we, we're led to believe it isn't, but it's actually already more, more solar power than oil, actually, more kilowatts right now. If you add in the natural gas, unfortunately, the petroleum people are still doing more energy production in the U.S., you know, but otherwise the solar has gone really big. I was talking, people have not noticed. I was talking to a guy yesterday who's a part of a group who's designing solar units for mm -hmm. Africa, where there's no uh, understru you know, infrastructure. Right. They don't have electric, so uh, they, you can have a panel on your hut and the light will give you a light and right. it'll power your computer and you don't need to be on the grid. This is like hopscotching. Oh, it's, great. it's just a nice yeah, yeah. thing for future. Yeah. And also something that I want to get, maybe you'll get one and maybe you all get one. <laughs> Apparently they designed a, a wind power unit, which isn't a giant blade. It's a small box that because of the design cleverly makes a wind tunnel. So a oh. five mile an hour wind can power this and power your house. Oh, that's this is just cool. to say that yeah, his yeah, visionary, tube things, yeah. yeah, the technology, uh, advances in technology are making this happen. There is a saying, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, that's right. Okay. That's very good, very good. Just to clarify, Buddhist. we're not giving those I, I want to come back to your other that. question, Jay Jason, just for a second. Because, you know, people think that compassion, if you're too compassionate, like Carl Sagan used to talk about compassion fatigue. You know, you couldn't really worry about everybody starving and there was too much for you. Mm -hmm. But actually the Dalai Lama's point that, and the Tibetan psychology, Buddhist inner technology is, the more you expand your compassion, the happier you become as the compassion giver. And because compassion is not just empathy of like wallowing with the suffering being in their suffering only. Mm -hmm. It is a determination and an energy to help them out of their suffering. So it sort of must keep an inner vision of the possibility of rising out of the suffering, kind of the hope thing, and it shares that hope. So actually, when you're really sensitive in a, to a vast outreach of feeling the suffering really very broadly, which is the definition of an enlightened person, then you actually have an inner bliss. This, it seems very contradictory, and even the Sanskrit word for compassion, karuna, means stopping uh, pleasure, meaning that you are giving up your focus on your own seeking of pleasure, and you're focusing on others and wanting them to have well, pleasure. But then Dalai Lama always says that famous thing. He says, if you want to be successfully selfish, be a wise selfish and be compassionate. Right. And also he says, if you, you know, the person who's compassionate, the first person who they help have less suffering is themselves. Right. <laughs> well, there's actually some interesting brain science about that. Now. Yes, oh good. Yeah, um, there's a book I just finished writing, it'll come out in September, called oh, Altered good. Traits, what science tells us. What's it of, called? Altered Traits. Altered? Traits. Like altered traits. traits? Altered Traits. Okay. Science reveals how meditation transforms mind, body, and brain. Oh, great. And the chapter on loving kindness meditation, on compassion, yes. uh, sh shows that the data is very strong that the, what you do is strengthen the centers for well-being uh -huh. and good feeling by being compassionate. And in fact, when you're generating compassion, that's what lights up in the brain. Yes. So the first, per as he said, the first person who benefits from compassion is the one who feels it. Yeah. But it's very tricky that. because if they yeah. then shift and they think about, oh, I want to feel better, so I'm going to be more compassionate, then it's not real compassion. Well, <laughs> and they start true. feeling worse. Yeah. There's yeah. some catch-22s <laughs> here. What? <laughs> catch-22s. It is. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. one. I actually have a question about that. So Richie Davidson up in uh, University of Wisconsin, his Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, they're studying the best routes to compassion and why do we... Um, uh, uh, sorry, and at the Max Planck Institute, they're studying methods for cultivating compassion. Right. I'm wondering, why do we need best roots, or why do we need to cultivate? In some ways, sure. should it be our default? And if it isn't, why do we go to well, less okay. healthy so states? Well, okay, so Richie Davidson, or Dr. Richard Davidson, is my co-author on the book. And I'm very familiar with what they're doing. And also, Tanya Singer is the woman at Max Planck Institute who's been uh, doing uh, very excellent research on empathy and compassion. And your question, which is an interesting context, is why do we need that? And I think the answer is because we don't have enough of it. 
Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at kids, toddlers have a lot of empathy and generosity. If you have it like a three-year-old like grandchild or child, they're always giving people something to eat or you know, offering. But by the time they get to kindergarten, kids become very self-centered, unless it turns out, uh, and this is something they did at Wisconsin, you put them through a kindness program mm. where they get re rewarded and encouraged to be kind instead of like it's all about me and mm -hmm. how well I did. And those kids don't become selfish when they go to first grade. So what it says is there's a developmental line, just like there is for physical growth, there's one for emotional growth, including uh, compassion and kindness. And the, in this culture, we have ignored it. That's why we need it. That's why uh, I would say that uh, practices that cultivate compassion are like a remedial education, uh, particularly for adults. But we could also put it into schools. And many schools are starting to do this. I was just talking to the International Baccalaureate High Schools. It's a global program, very high level, mm -hmm. often public schools, uh, excellent curriculum, like a prep school. Mm -hmm. And they're starting a program in uh, compassionate systems thinking. Wonderful. Uh, and, and that kind of thing at different levels, kindergarten through 12, is going on here and there around the world. I think it's, it's part of this program for, for, for a better world, Absolutely. yeah. The more we do it, the, the better we'll Absolutely. be. And, right. and what Davidson is showing is that this actually changes the brain of people who go through it, not just meditators, but kids who have a curriculum in what's called now social emotional learning, which is designed to help kids become more self-aware, manage themselves better, their disruptive feelings, impulses, and so on, uh, be empathic and be kind and cooperative. That changes the brain of those kids in a very good way. You know, and good, good upbringing would do that, but we can't guarantee that every kid in every society is gonna get that. So I think the schools, and His Holiness, by the way, his, his last program is Educate the Heart. Mm -hmm. That's one of his, his emphases these days, is this right. kind of education for kids. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that the brain, from in the Tibetan neurology, includes the heart. Exactly. The whole exactly. body, yes. the whole nervous system. Yeah, yeah. The whole central nervous system. Uh -huh. That's yeah. wonderful. You know, the, the force for good thing, Dan's beautiful presentation of His Holiness's initiatives, you could say, that, and friends of His Holiness like Dan and uh, Richie Davidson and so on, it has to do with the fact that His Holiness, from a very long time ago, has been uh, consistently against religions converting each other's followers. And he's told the Pope, several popes, he's told the Archbishop of Canterbury, Muslim leaders in India, Hindu leaders, uh, Jewish leaders that he feels that everyone should keep their grandmother's religion <laughs> and that they should they dialogue with people in other religions and learn some things but he doesn't want he, he's not selling Buddhism in other words and people are surprised they think well he's a great Buddhist guru and then he teaches groups but he always says use anything you learn within your life if it improves it if it doesn't reject it but you keep it culturally and ideologically within the context of your born culture. And then he, when, he, when he gets into that shtick, he looks at me and he like, he like well, some people can't help themselves. <laughs> 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 he sort of gets into that. But so the force for good thing is the way Buddhism, he sees that Buddhism being of help in outreaching in other cultures that are not Buddhist and reinforcing Jesus if it's Christian, you know, and reinforcing Moses or Rabbi Hillel if it's Judaism and reinforcing Muhammad and the great saints of Islam if it's Islam oh, and Hinduism, of course, it's, Hinduism is really very close to Buddhism nowadays, uh, Taoism or whatever, and even the humanistic idea of the secular people who want good for, good for others. So that's sort of how they kind of hook up in his, in his life. And why we were so, why I've been going nuts over Dan's book for several years now. So, uh, as we're talking about the science, I understand when he was a young boy, or maybe a, a little older, the Dalai Lama would um, help fix the generator in the, in the palace. He would, uh, there were two cars apparently there at the time that, that were carried in through the, through the mountains, and he would help, uh, you know, try to put the cars together. And First he stuff. took them apart. Right, I think. Fair enough. Yeah, watches too, watches. He was watches. fixing watches. Right, and yeah. then he comes, you know, he becomes this global ambassador, and his goal is to meet with the world's most renowned sciences, uh, scientists, uh, to sit with them and really work on how to bring their, their work into, into his and, and Melba. 
What is it like when he's in a room with you know five premier scientists? What well, does he talk about with them? It, you know, it's surprising um, because he's self-taught. He is extremely sharp. I think it's his logic, logic yes, background. Yes, very, very philosophical. Because a, a scientist will make a presentation, this is my work, and then he'll start some, a line of questioning that will often end up with the scientist saying, and that's the experiment we want to do next. He's extremely sharp and intuitive uh, about science. And the other thing is that um, what started as kind of tutorials for him actually became a reverse that the scientists really were looking to him for an ethical rudder because science has none. In general, there's a kind of attitude that this is for the greater good and for humanity. But scientists themselves deal with ethical conundrums and they need some grounding in that. And there's nothing in scientific education that helps that. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of so the dialogues have started to go that way too quite a bit. Yeah, his holiness always had the idea of the meeting of the outer sciences. In ancient India, biology, physics, and medicine, these things, these were all considered outer sciences. And the, the, the king or queen of the sciences was the inner science, what they called, which was psychology. Because Buddha initially you know, did not discover that there's a god in the universe. They, they, actually, Buddha did talk to the god in the universe. They, he did. But that god, in the case of the Buddha, said, Actually, I didn't create it, and I'm not omnipotent. So you guys have to like figure it out. Please tell human beings that they're going to have to do it. And also, he, Brahma, you know, he was particularly anxious that Buddha tell human beings that when horrible things happen to them, it wasn't his fault. Oh, really? So Ali Wiesel need not be mad at him you know, because <laughs> he couldn't stop the negative things that happened to them. You know, so that's in the Buddhist text from thousands of years ago, the Pali text. You know, that that, that incident. And, uh, and so Buddha discovered that, you know, we have to save ourselves through education, really, and through knowledge of reality and the reality of our own minds. So that's why Buddhism itself is called, in Buddhist cultures, not a religion, it's called inner science. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a, in other words, just a credo, you know, a, a blind faith belief. It's like that, you know. So that's just, you know, Dan has been so valuable over the years. That's why I'm so happy he's here in Tibet House with us, um, he's so, and I hope he'll come back at a, at a Force for Good event sometime during oh, the fall or, or the spring. Or uh, an so altered trade in event. In an evening. But how, how about an altered trade event? The new book. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good. Okay. I'm coming sure. to that, yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm programming here now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Check the calendar. Because he's been so valuable to his holiness and such a valuable friend and a really good friend, a hard friend, and, and also sort of connecting this outer and inner sciences, which I think is vital to the planet. One of the four reasons for hope that the Dalai Lama has that is, among other things, one that, you know, I won't list the other three, so it will be lengthy, but you know, you'll find them in the book, the detail in the book, but one of them is that in the year 1900, materialist science was going to change the universe and it was going to solve every problem with the idea, you know, the, the great, what is it, 1898, the London Expo, showing all the mm, marvelous machines mm, and right. things. You know, and there were a few people, a few poets, like writing books like Frankenstein. <laughs> no, it right? might not work out, the romantics. But the Enlightenment, the Western Enlightenment, uh, which has a lot of things in common with the Buddhist Enlightenment, but, it, but in a way it got a little like carried away with the mechanism of the universe. But they was very confident that that's, it became the powerful thing, science. And the spiritual people had to all kind of kowtow to them and sort of say, yeah, well, we, it's ours is an irrational faith, yeah, but you need to be a little irrational, you got to go to the synagogue or the church and the mosque and feel good, you know, mm -hmm. even though anyways, it doesn't really make sense and the scientists, you scientists didn't discover God, you know, so it, it became a sort of thing like that, you know, so the, but he says in this century, people are looking back at the spiritual traditions and seeing if there's, not, in addition to well-being there, some kind of knowledge of how to cult. I mean, even the very idea that love and compassion can be cultivated and developed in an educational way, and not just like either you have it or you don't, is something kind of new for, for, the, for the West, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's uh, one of his reasons for hope, because he thinks that you have to look scientifically at the nature of the mind. You know? Is there anything, so the premise of the Four Noble Truths is that we're born into suffering and we have to acknowledge it in order yeah. to move forward. Is there anything about this cultivation of compassion and, and love 
that yeah. can address that specifically to undo the premise that we're always going to be born into suffering and oh, dealing yes. with a lifetime of suffering? I think not this about is a suffering. That's the whole thing. Poor Pope Benedict. Mm -hmm. He was very, and even for John Paul before they, uh, the Paul before, uh, or whatever. Which one was it before Benedict? I forgot. But what happened? You okay? Oh, and uh, uh, he was so worried in the threshold of hope, the, pre the two popes ago, he wrote a book, but that book was written by Benedict when he was Ratzinger, who was the grand inquisitor at that time, you know, the head of the office of the doctrine of the faith, which is the inquisition, and what, you know, that's the inquisition. And he wrote, how can anybody be a Buddhist? They so, must be so miserable, all of them, the, sitting there in the suffering, and that's all they got is suffering, and, Look at us here in Rome. We're jolly and happy. You know, we have uh, red Gucci loafers. But no, never mind. I'm <laughs> making a joke. But the point is, that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Buddha's discovery is the third noble fact, you could even call it, or truth, or reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is nirvana, mm -hmm. which is the freedom from suffering. Right. It's not the destruction or the end of life. It's the end of suffering. And that's why people like Buddhism. You know, Asian people like to have fun, too. You know, so they're not going to get into, oh, let's all suffer, you know. And then, the only, as the Dalai Lama says, the only reason, the first noble fact, or fact for a, a more, a more uh, compassionate person, even the definition of noble had to do with compassion, actually, why I quote it noble. The first one is just, if you, if you, you went out and promoted the first noble fact without having discovered the third one, You'd be like someone who is going to someone whose life in prison and has no way of parole and going, nya, nya, you'll never get out. Mm -hmm. And what would be the point of that? Right. The reason that he says the unenlightened life will be frustrating and inadequate and unsatisfactory and will be ultimate, even, even the temporary pleasure or relief is suffering in the sense that it doesn't last, you know, and it ends in death and sickness and old age and all this. And so, that's only to spur people to find out that they're capable of terminating suffering by attaining nirvana. I mean, in other words, freedom from suffering, which is not that hard to attain for a human being, mm -hmm. and uh, according to the Buddha. So that's why he, he launched this huge educational process throughout the world, mm -hmm. you know. So the third noble truth, so, so the Pope, you know, I, 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 through the press, I kind of tried to reassure Cardinal Ratzinger not to worry that it wasn't that, the Buddhists were pretty jolly, actually, because they looked forward to an end of suffering, mm -hmm. in fact. And, and part of achieving that end of suffering is acknowledging that as long as I'm a selfish jerk, I'm going to have a hard time. Even I become president of the United States, or I live in a, <laughs> I live in a triplex. <laughs> if I'm going to just be out for me, then, it's, uh, then everybody else is going to hate my guts. Right. Right? right? That's, uh, that's sort of the lesson. And the science is helping us reach more yes, people with this. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Because, because why? The inner science is looking at the reality of life. Mm -hmm. That's what Buddha's thing was. It wasn't what believes something that's sort of unrealistic. It was looking at the reality of life. And, and we humans are very interentangled with each other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, without compassion, we're doomed. You know? We will not remain in the human life form. And I, I would say that the scientific findings that we review are all... Uh, in accord with and align with what the classical texts say yeah. uh, are the changes that people go through. I think so. Although, you know, the, the problem with the scientists, uh, there's a wonderful NYU and New York College. Uh, Thomas Nagel, mm -hmm. great philosopher you have down over here, down the street here at NYU. Mm -hmm. He recently wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, which I love. I love his earlier books too. And uh, in that book, he says that the attempt to explain the nature of life is particularly after the biologists by trying to reduce everything to some materialistic processes is doomed to failure. And he makes a very sort of limited but very strong philosophical set of arguments that kind of show that. Mm -hmm. But they're kind of stuck with that. And he, said, and he said the reason they're so stuck with it is they think if they open up to a mind, which he, he notes very perspicaciously, they all have one. <laughs> <laughs> Every scientist has a mind, I hope. Yeah. And, and he says, if they do, they're afraid it will come back to sort of theism, and they'll be burned at the stake, like Giordano Bruno, or they'll be like Galileo in, in silence, and they won't get tenure, and they won't get research funding. <laughs> so, they, so they're very frightened to give up on this, this, this sort of dogmatic materialism, rather than, and then he, Nagel says, he's sure there is a way in which the mind can be brought back into nature and be an object of scientific study, 
um, without, uh, without sacrificing sort of practicality and specificity and phenomenology or blah, blah, whatever you want to call it. And that's what they have to discover. And actually, that's the Buddhist inner science. So it's how the mind shapes life. Right. And along with all physical things, you know. Just, just to speak from a, but that's to, to speak to your point from yes. a, a point of view of science. Um, first of all, I think that science itself is acknowledging what's called the hard problem. Scientists cannot explain how the mind emerges right. from physical matter, from the brain. Uh, second, when we look at the data uh, from very advanced meditators, uh -huh. Tibetan yogis, we know we're just getting a glimpse of something much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not to reduce it, it's just to uh -huh. say, wow, <laughs> something's going on there. Yeah. Uh, and I think that um, eventually the Dalai Lama is very interested in this dialogue between spirit and science. He feels it's very important. Maybe you could speak to why, maybe you've already spoken really, to why it's important, but this has been a theme of his for decades now. Oh, definitely. Yeah. A, a passion. Um, could we turn to the book to sure. Tibet specifically? <coughs> yes, I, wanted, yes. I wanted to address to Tibet quite a bit. Because I'm trying to, I want people to get the book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, because the, the man on the cover is intertwined with the, the book is, it, it's his, it's the Dalai Lama story, but it's also the country story. That's they're, right. They're intertwined. He's totally intertwined with the country. Could you explain, I don't know if a lot of folks have a very clear picture. What was Tibet like in, let's say, 1950, 1955? and compared to 1959 to the present. Well, pre-1950 is pre-Chinese entry into Tibet, right. invasion, a military invasion of Tibet. Right. So there were very few Chinese, maybe nobody lived there all year round because it's the altitude, it makes you sick to try to live there all year round. Mm -hmm. But people there were traders and people would kind of come and go, uh, and some diplomats and uh, uh, Chinese people. And uh, what Tibet was like was very, a little bit grubby. Their plumbing was not really up to snuff you could say, and uh, was cold and uh, so forth. And even the Buddhist monks who have very rigid prescriptions, it's a kind of minor sin in Buddhist monasticism to slurp your food. But Buddhist monks were allowed to slurp their soup. Uh, they banned those particular 18 provisions about non-slurping because in very cold weather, you want to slurp your, to get it hot into your stomach, to get it past your mouth, you know, and get it hot in there. Right. So they were allowed to slurp, they had a slurpathon. And so, <laughs> so it was like that, but they were pretty cheery, you know, and there were problems. Uh, they were actually not feudal, even Dalai Lama will say, yeah, we were feudal, and the Chinese communist propaganda is that they were feudal, but that's actually not correct. They ceased being feudal mostly in the 17th century just like, um, like the, or before the Russians let go of their serfs, actually. Mm -hmm. And they stopped having what you call, you know, the life ownership by a landlord of a peasant, you know, which is sort of definition of feudalism mm -hmm. by Marx. That, that's not the case, that's just Chinese propaganda. Chinese propaganda was that Tibet was so backward, it's been, was legitimate of them to invade it and modernize it and make it a nice, happy, cultural revolution, communist country. Mm -hmm. In fact, enslave the entire population and wreck the ecology and completely destroy up to a million, uh, maybe more Tibetans right. in the process. Unnaturally, I mean, people do die and are reborn, but they did too slowly. So Tibet was, they were kind of cheerful. And I, I can only illustrate it by like a, a vision I had in the center of Lhasa a few years ago. I guess I went about 15, 20 times up to, up to 207. And, uh, there was a Tibetan guy who had just bowed from Kham about 1,500 miles every three steps. And he was all dusty and obviously not healthy. His teeth, he needed dental work for sure. And, but he, was, he was, had reached Lhasa and he reached the holy temple there in Lhasa and he had a grin on his face. He had a big energy physically. And he was like, he was in glory actually. So happy, you know, although he, someone else might have thought, oh, what a misery, this guy, you know, he's been crawling along the earth for thousands of miles. And then around him, suspiciously, were five or six, what we called in those days, sneaker soldiers, the Chinese young people who were stuck up there and a very unpleasant uh, duty. And they have, they were, they're not the track troops, these guys were not, but they were four or five, but they had cattle prods and they had guns and things, but they weren't fully helmeted and riot police type. And there were three or four of them looking, and they were freaked out by this guy. And they, ha they looked, if Paul Ekman saw their faces, he would say, those people are very unhappy. Yeah. They're, on, they're not happy here trying to control these people. 
And they didn't have a personal body energy like that at all. They had a kind of very frightened look. And they were frightened of this completely powerless guy. Mm -hmm. And they were frightened of the joyfulness of that guy. Mm -hmm. So I would say Tibet was, you know, the Dalai Lama, the first to say it was backward technologically, infrastructurally, et cetera. They didn't have this and that, you know. But, um, you know, I often use the famous thing of the Confucian teacher, Mencius, who was asked by his local king, petty king, duke, uh, that there was a very bad ruler in the neighboring country and he wanted to go and fix up that country, make them happy because they didn't have a proper Confucian ruler, he thought. So then Mencius said, well, your majesty, that might be good. And here's the acid test. Go to the border and if the people at the border invite you in to come and remove the ruler and rule them yourself, then you can say he's a bad ruler and you, know, you, you have a right to fix the place up. Said, but if they resist you at the border, they don't mind their own ruler that much, you know, whatever the nature of their society. So it's not legitimate for you to say you're fixing them up and actually dominate them and oppress them. You know. so, so then after Chinese came, it became a hell on earth. In the book, there are quotes from His Holiness himself in the 60s, in his March 10th speeches, you know, just one or two lines, you know, where he says, oh, it's atrocious what's going on, it's terrible, the world, please listen. He calls out and cries out for help. But starting with the British in the early part of the 20th century, who sold Tibet out to the first the Manchus and the nationalists, even though they knew and they invaded Tibet because they knew Tibet was not governed by China actually at all or occupied by it. And you had to deal with Tibetans directly, but Tibetans were kind of stonewalling them. They were frightened of the British because they weren't Buddhists. You know? They, went, they hadn't, weren't used to that. And, but they became fond of them, actually, that. But then British never really stood up for them. Like the 13th, the Dalai Lama's predecessor would, had declared independence, which is where we begin the story, in 1912, 13, and made a flag and all this kind of thing in a modern way because he realized that just being independent wasn't enough, you had to show it. And then he tried to send ambassadors to the League of Nations in Geneva, and the Brits prevented it. And the governor generals of India wanted to support it, but the, but the Hong Kong British managed to lobby in London and prevent them from presenting their credentials. So that led to this disaster now. And also when the Chinese first invaded, the Tibetans appealed to the United Nations and the British ambassador at the United Nations said, yeah, that's not China's place. They are invading there. That we should say something about. Because this was the time of Korean War, you know, just starting. And then the next day, he got a call from London. He said, well, it's not quite clear. Maybe it is an internal matter. Oh, because everybody wants to sell them out to make business with China, you know, or, or somehow are politically afraid of China, one or the other. But Nehru sort of sold them out too. But he luckily protected them within India, which was why they still survive as a culture. You know. But he wouldn't let the Dalai Lama speak for years. He wouldn't speak himself to Mao about it. Uh, he thought he and Mao would be big buddies up until 1962 when he realized when he, Mao broke his heart by invading uh, Assam you know, and uh, na uh, Northeast area. So, so the, you know, the Dalai Lama has, and the Tibetans have suffered tremendously. It's the largest territorial annexation, much bigger than the Crimea, you know, much bigger than, than you know, Saddam Hussein and the Kuwaitis. You know, they both speak Arabic, you know, but the Tibetans don't speak Chinese mostly. And Chinese definitely don't speak Tibetan. So it really was a complete cultural, you know, attempt at assimilation and things. And that's why the Chinese are, have been doing ethnocide the whole time, which is because it's not a personal thing. They're not, they're not, they don't dislike <laughs> Tibetans personally. They actually are studying with them even in communist China. A lot of communists sneak over to the Lama and get some teaching. Uh, without letting their colleagues necessarily know about it. It's very popular in mainland China, and not only in Taiwan and so on. But it's because the Chinese are trying to claim that Tibet is an internal matter, and it will always belong to them, which is not true. And, but, and, but, and the refutation of it is the existence of Tibetan culture, and their language, and their complete difference. Even the different kind of Buddhism, almost you could say, although it fits together beautifully, actually. And in the future, Tibetan Buddhism will bring new resources from India to Chinese Buddhism, and there'll be a huge renaissance of both of them after the Chinese leadership decides that it's more intelligent to let people have a little opiate of the people, you know, a little spirituality. Yeah. And the Dalai Lama, sponsoring the Dalai Lama by a Chinese emperor even, 
makes the Chinese people like their emperor and trying to like squash the spirituality of the people doesn't make them happy since not everyone is going to have a Mercedes uh, a limousine like the Communist Party members do. You know? What needs to happen in order for that to happen? What need, well, uh, Dalai Lama says, wait. <laughs> he does, <yeah. laughs> But he's also tired of waiting. He's been waiting a long time. A long time. Yeah. And uh, what needs to happen, I think, is for the Chinese uh, leadership to have better public relations advice and to try to do real soft power. In other words, so far they've been advised that because they've been able to uh, sort of try to you know, have the great firewall on the internet and make uh, some of the internet companies of the West you know, kowtow to them or block them, you know, this kind of thing, sell them routers that block certain things, uh, you know, and everyone's happy to make business with them, so far. But in a way, you can't have people, soft power means people like you, you know, they want to listen to your music, they want to be like you, which America used to have before certain uh, ruling cliques took over. We just kind of lost a whole bunch of it. And uh, therefore, you have to actually be doing nice things to get real soft power and be doing something beautiful. So you can't be crushing people in your under your power and then pretend you're liberating them and they're so happy with it. That won't work. The, 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 the information gets out. Everybody knows everything in the connected world, right? So if they had public relations advice, uh, which I gave them free, I wrote another book, <laughs> Dan knows, called Why the Dalai Lama Matters, in which I outlined the win-win situation for China and Tibet, which I, I didn't, this is Dalai Lama's story, so I didn't put it in here really, but he, it's, he knows that, it's in his epilogue. And that is, I guarantee the president of China his own personal Nobel Peace Prize if he would befriend the Dalai Lama and befriend the Tibetan people and think of it as a jewel that would attract the world to this beautiful country with these wonderful, having these wonderful dances, these like wonderful paintings, sexy paintings, Dharma, Dharma for ferocity against the bad guys. I mean, really fun. Look, look at how much fun everybody's having here in these paintings. <laughs> they really, there you have a man, you have mom and dad Buddha right there. Yeah. That's the Kala Chakra, who is the Dalai Lama's favorite Kala Chakra that he teaches all the time. And the, and the mom is Buddha too. Yeah. Not just the dad. Mom is Buddha. Yeah. You know? Well, like, I, you I know? actually think, Bob, what? I think the real treasure is what these represent in, in consciousness. Right. What these images represent in consciousness is the yeah. real treasure that, sure. that's the real value of, yeah. of the Tibetan culture. Yeah, it's like you can, you know, to be, if you are compassionate and if you use the inner science, like the and the and the force for good people are working on and develop that, then your eros and thanatos, you know, the erotic and the fierce, you know, that Freud was so scared about, oh, you know, the tip the consciousness is tip of the iceberg. Eros and thanatos are churning down there, and like, you know, let me have another cigar and over in Vienna, and I worry, I worry about it. Freud was very worried about that, but the Buddhist inner science wants you to find your unconscious. Get these energies out there where they can vivify your life, and, but not act them out. Don't kill people and don't do all kind of weird sexual abuse on people, but have this, this powerful energies and be able to use them consciously in a positive way, in art and in interaction and compassionately. And uh, so they really do have a great knowledge like that. The Christian monastics and the Sufis also, and the Hasidics in the case of Judaism, the, the secret people in all of the spiritual traditions had a spiritual science. Mm. And, uh, and the, the Buddhist one just is sort of was less suppressed because those cultures were richer than the European culture. The reason that the Europeans had to go and do colonialism is that they didn't have a lot of spices and decent cooking, you know? Or Yorkshire pudding was like eating a piece of leather in the <laughs> old days. And then they, they ruined and overcooked the beef and the vegetables. And then they, they now you're Brompton Road, you have Indian restaurants, and you know, the, the Brits are cheered up. You know. And uh, West is backward, and those people more advanced. That's why they didn't execute their mystics, who are the happier people. Mm -hmm. Like we used to burn the women in Europe. Excuse me. That wasn't cool. You know? So, so anyway, Tibet was pretty jolly in its backward way. And they were kind of doing with a once a month a bath, you know. And, but they didn't smell that bad. They were kind of fun. And, and, uh, and then they came and they've been enslaved. It's been a terrible, like, invasion and occupation and things. 
And we could, and in a way, I feel, and the Tibetans feel sorry for the Chinese because they're stuck up. Why was Tibet as big as uh, all of Western Europe, from the Urals, including the European part of Russia, Tibetan plateau was, over 12,000 feet, average altitude of 14 feet. Why was it empty of like only 6 million people? It wasn't only monasticism, that's part of it. The population was balanced. But it's also, it's, uh, you have to have special physiology. You have to have nitric oxide produced in your lungs to spread the, the lesser Tibet, oxygen. Tibetans have happens. a unique gene. That, what? The Tibetans have a unique gene. They have this weird That allows them gene, to you know. uh, metabolize more oxygen from right. thinner air than anyone and, else. And that's why, otherwise Chinese had a lot of extra people for thousands of years, but they weren't up there. And they won't be able to colonize it now. So it's just sort of naturally going to be, it's going to work out. When people are more realistic, it'll work out. In the meantime, how is the art, in it, the art, the energy, the culture that you're talking about, how is it being inhibited? Does it play out in little bits and pieces at all? Or is it oh, really they destroyed over 6,000 monasteries. Yeah. They trashed zillions of paintings right. and sculptures. They melt, melted them down. Uh, Some were looted and sold in the international market. And just now, one Chinese guy bought one back. He bought a pearl embroidered Ming Dynasty you know, mom and dad sort of Buddha oh, really? you know, uh, uh, painting icon mm -hmm. uh, for 47 million bucks in the, in the, at Christie's Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So you know, they, are, they, they themselves love this thing. You know? yeah. And uh, that's why they will, it will work out. And then Xi Jinping, uh, Hu Jintao did not accept my PR advice <laughs> and he remained hardline about Tibet. So he's now kind of, you don't hear much about him. But Xi Jinping I'm, is going to do it, I think. He will get his own Nobel Prize. Then they can let Liu Xiaobo out of jail who has a no, for, for the sin of getting a Nobel Prize. You know? and, and they'll have Dalai Lama as their citizen you know, uh, uh, who has a Nobel Prize. So there'll suddenly be three. They'll get three for one. Yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> Soft power. Yeah, right. And people will like Xi Jinping. He's kind of cute. His wife is a movie star and a singer. And they're Buddhists, actually, the Xi Jinping, the Xi family. And we we're very hopeful. His father was a friend of the Dalai Lama when Dalai Lama was 19 oh, really? down in uh, Beijing. And we we're hoping she will, she will be peaceful. You know? She will be Shiva. That's the Indian word for peace. She. It's auspicious. But we're talking about compassion too. And the Dalai Lama yeah. the whole time has felt nothing but compassion toward the Chinese yeah. on this matter. Yeah. Well, you, compassion he? can be a little fierce. There's right, such a thing as fierce compassion. compassion. Right. You know, it's like mom, when the kid is about to stick their finger in the electric socket, she screams, don't do that. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit fierce, but it's out of compassion for the child. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not saying everybody's like just lala all the time. But, uh, but yes, he has, he has used, you know, in Buddhism, the meditation on the enemy. The enemy is the great teacher of your patience, mm -hmm. your tolerance, and your forgiveness. That's, uh, that is like chapter and verse of the Buddhist psychology. And Dalai Lama teaches that. And I think you've talked about muscular compassion. What, is that, what does that look yeah, like? Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Well, muscular compassion. Well, um, as I said, they have a lot of nitric oxide, the Tibetans. They have like something like 100 times the nitric oxide level that, that low altitude people have. And your know, nitric oxide is what bodybuilders use, you know, like Arnold and things, you know, because <laughs> it increases blood flow dramatically in the system. Right. And so, um, they're muscular. <laughs> they, <laughs> actually, they wrestle yaks. <laughs> actually, and they're compassionate. That right? phrase is from Force for Good. What's that? Is that phrase is from Force for right, Good, muscular right, compassion, yes. which oh, is. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, oh, I because uh, I, I use the phrase because I, right, I was shocked right because, word. you know, I thought compassion, it's like being really nice to a lot of people. Yeah. But it's. Is the Dalai Lama is a social activist. Yes. He's a, a really. Uh, he, he's fierce when it comes to opposing whatever harms people. So it, there's this ferocity as needed, and the default mode is the, the compassion we think of. That's a great so that's phrase. It. Is that your phrase, muscular compassion? I, it might be my phrase, but I have to say this is he a great is book. He's the great writer. Listen, like this is a great book, and I want to say Bob has been really uh, not saying how much <laughs> he has been, uh, not at the level of Dalai Lama, but more than probably anyone else in the West, an advocate for Tibet and for the Dalai Lama. Uh, all these years, and I want to thank you. Well, for that. thank you, Ken. And I, think I do love the guy, and uh, although we have our arguments too, you know, because I'm a slow learner, you know, so I don't necessarily <laughs> listen to everything right away. But uh, you know, 
See, I consider his political advice is the only, he should be, they should go meet him in their G20s and G7s. And of course, Pope Francis is right in the same ballpark now. I think the previous one a little bit too much into their red Gucci loafers, you know. Right. But, but Pope, Fra Pope Francis is awesome. He's just right at kind of the same mold. And there's a lot of people like that popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, we, we are now like that. We should all be happy that we have an absolute disaster government mm -hmm. that is completely, obviously incompetent. And of course, they're going to cause some damage. But then we'll get back the House and the Senate in 2018 because we'll all realize it's too ridiculous. And they only got in there because only half of us vote because we're so complacent in this country. And now we're not complacent. And we will stay uncomplacent because they'll still kill, keep doing disasters. So that's actually really lucky. It shows how ridiculous the militaristic, you know, industrial, <laughs> oligarchic government, laissez-faire capitalism. Social capitalism is fine. It's actually excellent. We don't want like boring communism road to serfdom type of thing. We want nice, compassionate capitalism. That's way. And that's possible. Buddhists like merchants. You know, Buddhism spread throughout Asia and the world because they liked merchants. They, Buddha was from the warrior class, but he favored the merchant class. Because the great thing about the merchant class is when they go out and trade with somebody and far, far, you know, across the road, everybody gets something out of the deal. The problem with the military approach is you kill your customer. You take everything they have, and then they're not there to deal with next year. You, know, you wreck the place. And this seemed to work for the last few thousand years, since the time of Jesus and Buddha. And everybody said, don't do that. But they, nobody listened. And now they're going to have to listen, because nobody wins these wars now. And they just destroy other countries, is all they can do. And uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit von Clausewitz's definition of a victory. You know? All you get is terrorism out of it, because you killed everybody's grandmother right. or granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And then it won't, you, know, you can't get them to do what you want through war. Mm -hmm. so, so the guy now who's 54 billion more for the military, oh, let's do this, do that. You know, no, what's he, he going to do to North Korea? You can't, they, they, he can't do that. Mm -hmm. So. You know? No uh, we're just veering a little off. Well, I wonder how, how long do we have? Actually, I wanted to ask my last question and then open it up to oh, the audience. Yeah, how long do we have until the world time. system changes, you mean? No, till, till this ends. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just kidding. Well, I had a psychic tell me 2021. I'll be happy. 2021? Yeah. He said the world will have changed. Oh, will have changed. And I, that psychic got some other things right in the last decade or two. For me, for me personally. I'm not saying well, it has no we'll, evidential value. I haven't said that. We'll see. But... But he said, and I thought when he said I would feel happy because the world will have changed in mm -hmm. 2021, I thought he meant I'd be dead because I'll be 80 years old. <laughs> but, but no, he says, no, no, you'll be alive. You'll be relaxed. And uh, I, you know, Dalai Lama's te senior teacher told me I couldn't be relaxed until Dalai Lama was happy. They told me, he, he predicted that in I, the I, 70s. I, I, observing you, I think that's true. What? Observing you, I think that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just uh, do we have... Just on the this hour? is my last question, and then I'm going to yeah. open it up to the room. Oh, yeah, now we should open it up. Right? Oh, yeah. okay. One last real quick question. Okay. Um, the Dalai Lama has been described not just as a great spiritual leader, but also as a futurist. And I'm wondering what, yeah, that's Dan, what right? is the world, Dan, but what does the world look like in his ideal evolution with, with you know, sure. so compassion he, you everywhere? Know, and he talks about uh, four or five key points, and, you know, pipe in, but. Uh, one is uh, really a social justice. He says that the gap between rich and poor, which has been growing, is a moral crime. We need to reinvent our, uh, our econo economic system. Uh, he very much favors, actually, compassionate capitalism. Uh, he thinks that might be the, the middle way out. Uh, he is a very active environmentalist, <coughs> and so in in the future, I think that uh, the way we humans live on the planet would not just be sustainable, it would replenish. We would be giving back. Uh, I think that um, he talks about helping the, those in need, but by empowering them, not just giving them a handout, teaching them how to take care of themselves and so on. He talks about uh, the problem of us and them he really sees people as a, a oneness. Uh, you know, we're all the same human being. And I, I'm sure you've seen many times. I remember we, we once co-moderated in San Francisco 
Oh yeah, so that was an true. event with uh, uh, frontline activists, really. Yes. And uh, he went over to a guy who was standing by the door. He was like a security guy, and he re he really liked that guy. Do you remember? And yes. He, he, th what that's what I've seen him do time and time again is disregard status. Oh, I totally. You know, <laughs> he just doesn't buy into the, you know, who's the celebrity and because we're all the same. I w remember once. Uh, he was doing a kind of invitation-only meeting with CEOs, and this guy uh, was hired to photograph the event. And at the end, this photographer took a picture of the Dalai Lama and the CEO standing there a little stiffly. And at the end, they're breaking up, and the Dalai Lama says to the photographer, hey, come here, come here. And he holds him really close and tight and says, take a picture of us. That's, that's how he is. Yeah. And I think that's how the, the world that he foresees would be, is that we would put aside the us and them differences. And then finally, that edu we would educate children so that this would happen naturally. Mm -hmm. they, they'd have an outlook of compassion. Mm -hmm. So I th that's, is, that's my sense of I think so. the, the uh, better world that he envisions. Yeah. Education, he's very into the education. Because that hasn't been the case with Buddhism all the time. And, and we talked earlier about what? we talked earlier about how um, we might look to cultures of the past that would embody what we're hoping for in the future. Are there a couple of cultures you would single out? Yes, well, in one single way, and that is from the time of the Buddha himself. Every place that was infected by the Buddhist uh, notion, quest of happiness, let's say, quest of freedom from suffering. He sort of happiness. The Buddha didn't say immediately. He just said freedom from suffering. Because he knew that in most authoritarian countries, happiness is illegal. And everyone's scared of it, actually. And the, and the rulers, particularly, they don't want people being too happy because then they won't want to work too hard for them. You know? So they won't want to die and kill some people in a, in a war. You know? So it's been sort of verboten, happiness, pretty much. And we are all scared of it ourselves. So that is the Buddhist thing, is education for happiness. To, Understanding the brain, understanding the mind, understanding culture, and so on, and and we and we are wrongly taught in the West that if you don't have a big army and you're not like armed to the teeth, or you don't have your martial art, or you're not a you're not a big muscular bully fighter, that you're going to have a terrible time. But the Indian people, and I, who originally were big empires and very powerful, more they defeated the Macedonians. Nobody invaded India in, in ancient times. But they became gentle and vulnerable and happy. And they made all those nice ragas that they make, you know, and delicious food. Then the Tibetans had a big, fierce empire, and everybody was scared of them. And they stopped that because, you know, then you get more happy when you drop violence. And then they helped the Mongolians drop it, who had been the most conquering people of all. And so it's not true that everybody always has to remain armed to the teeth. It is true that when people are vulnerable, up to now in history, they have been taken advantage of. Somebody comes in and conquers. Some less civilized people come and get them. But we're now in a thing where everybody on the whole planet is unable to conquer everybody else. Nobody can actually win a war, as we've seen since the quote-unquote Great War. And uh, in a way, the winners of the Great War were the two countries that lost. The three countries that lost. They made the best Toyotas and the best cars. <laughs> and they, I was just in Japan. They don't have potholes in the street. $50 a month, you can have health insurance for everybody, excellent doctors and things. They're, they're civilized because they only have less than 1% of a, of a this military budget instead of this huge uh, nonsense that we have, which we can't, all these weapons that we can't use. Although, there is a, Dalai Lama is so cute. In the, the second peace conference that we did, Dan, there was a big agitation started by Jody, the landmine lady. Oh, yeah. That everybody should just give up all their weapons, you know. And then that was a big thing from the audience about that. Oh, yeah, let's give up all the weapons. So then his audience, you know, the absolute symbol of nonviolence, he says, yeah, not quite yet. <laughs> Hold on to a few of them just a little longer. <laughs> he said, and then, ooh, people were like, oh, oh, what does that mean? They were all like freaked out. But, but I think what he means by that is that, um, you know, I think maybe he thought at the time that the, that the, the people like standing up for democracy should the state to protect themselves. And then, you know, he doesn't, the slogan, I have a slogan I call, we shift from mad to mud, but I think my slogan is not quite right. Mad is mutual assured destruction, right? So that's where you can't really have a war because you can't escalate. Mud is mutual unilateral disarmament. And that means everybody's sort of 
push them down together, you know, but then everyone has to have equal thing. Mm. And uh, for example, re lately, this will horrify everybody, but lately there's been all this writing, if you've been reading in the press about North Korea, nobody can do anything about it. Oh, Trump might try and then the South Korea will be obliterated, not to mention North Korea. And they will have back in the Korean War, you know, it's like everybody's in this thing about this, this unstoppable thing. Oh, China's gonna do it. Well, China says they can't, right? So this is huge. They, they, they thrive, these violent, incompetent, greedy, you know, laissez-faire, oligarchic people want the world to feel there are these insoluble things that only they can stop, right? They want that, so we're all stuck on that, right? Anybody got a solution for Korea? I just came up with it when I was driving over here on 19th Street. <laughs> oh, yeah. Although I was actually following a joke told by my son. What is the one the absolute solution for that North Korea guy? Uh, tell me. Give the South Koreans a few nukes. Just line them up, just still plant a couple, you know, they're doing the tad, but that's not enough. Give them a couple of nukes, yeah. just a couple, like half a dozen nukes. <laughs> and then they're aiming them at, uh, at Kim Il Jong's like hairdo. <laughs> they home in on this uh, bushy hair. Uh -huh. And then, no, they can't, he can't use his nukes. They can't use their nukes. Then, then yeah. he, maybe they have to talk. Because it's mad. What? It's mutually assured destruction. I can't hear you. It's mad. Mutually assured destruction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think I was premature with my mad to mud. Yeah, eventually, then that's mud, but everybody uh -huh. has to, for mud, you have to be mutually armed, and then you sort of, two guys put their pistols down, their, their pistols so, are wired on each other's temples, and they both put them down at the same instant. That's right. And they have to both be vulnerable and risk something when they finally let go of the trigger, you know? So we could talk for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we can. But that's the solution, I finally know. Actually, wrote. Kenneth Waltz, who used to teach up at Columbia. What? Uh, Kenneth Waltz, who used to teach at Columbia, yeah. was a real proponent of what you're describing. Really? Yeah. Big fan. Oh. Um, all right, so it is okay. time to uh, open Questions this from to the, the audience, audience. Yeah. please. Uh, is there a microphone available? It was supposed Any to question? be awesome. Okay, so if someone has a question, they want to raise their hand. There's a lot of topics. There's a hand yeah. back there. There's one. <laughs> Yeah, please, but hold the mic close, okay, so everyone can hear. Thank you for coming today. Put the mic to your mouth. Thank you for coming today. Um, I don't know if it's on, I'll talk loudly. Right. But um, I'm interested in the comment about uh, the secularization or the fact that the Dalai Lama doesn't necessarily bring the Buddhism uh, with his teachings, which I yes. fully understand and, and see uh, many impacts of things like mindfulness-based stress reduction, which has taken that element out of the world. I think now this is on. Okay, okay great. Okay. So, but I'm curious as a scientist that has worked so closely with him, what impact has it had on the science that, that takes place, the stories of Paul Ekman having that healing uh, touch, yeah. uh, but also just in your experience as mind and life evolved, have you seen scientists either uh, you know, just change from, you know, get closer or adopt the mystical aspect? And one other question. Um, related to that, that the, um, the Bhagavad Gita in the yoga tradition talks about bhakti or devotion as the most direct path. And I'm wondering if Buddhism has anything similar, that there is an extra element gained from devotion or from uh, following that path of Buddhism as yeah. a religion that can help the science anymore. Well, um, let me uh, first Stand. give an answer on, uh, the scientists are very profoundly affected by interacting with the holiness almost invariably. How that plays out in their lives is very different from scientist to scientist. Uh, I, I will say that um, it was because of his holiness Dalai Lama that Richie Davidson started devoting his lab to meditation research because it was clear that the, uh, you know, the religion of the West or modern age is science and that the language it would speak to most people was scientific findings. And I think that's a very, very powerful uh, medium. So uh, the short answer is that the scientists are changed. Now, there was another part to your question? Yeah, but, but wait, so the oh, well, yeah, so this is where I have to turn to you, but I know that there are, there is a, the equivalent of a bhakti stream in Buddhism, it's called guru yoga. And oh, it yeah. particularly has to do uh, with the student-teacher relationship, it, it's not so much, uh, you know, worshiping the form, but rather uh, 
appreciating the quality of being of the teacher and uh, having a kind of devotion to that, you could say, state of consciousness. Would you agree with that? I think so. I, I'm sorry that I apologize. I couldn't, my hearing aid and the echo and the whole thing, so I couldn't follow everything you were saying. Well, the question is, is there a st something like bhakti yoga oh, in sure. Buddhism? Uh, it could be that the uh, bodhisattva ideal and the uh, Buddhist bodhisattva literature, like Avalokiteshvara, compassionable Buddha, mm -hmm. Tara, the female form of that, it could be that was an engine of uh, bhakti actually in India. Because, you know, the old Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita was actually not your cuddly, lovable kind of guy, you know, but the Krishna of the Bhagavatam is suddenly lover boy, you know, and, and then, then you love him, you know. But the old Vedic gods, you didn't love the Vedic gods, you were scared of them, you know. So how did that change in India? And, and, and what you have with the Mahayana Buddhism is the bringing up the Bodhisattva idea, even in Buddha's own time, the Jataka tales when he was the monkey king, when he was the deer king. So the whole idea of the, even the different, uh, there's wonderful studies of the Emperor Ashoka, who was the first really serious Buddhist emperor in, uh, in India, and how he changed the notion of kingship from divine right of kings and the king as the, as the icon and the arbiter of violence, controlling by fear. And he started saying he was like the parent of everybody, and he was, he was like a father figure, and he, was, he loved his people. He wanted them to love him. You know, it's a whole, whole story like that. So um, you have the love of the bodhisattva. You have the idea that the divine or the most powerful force in the world, which is not a creator. You're, you yourself are a co-creator of the universe with the Buddha. But that that being loves you, and that love is the strong force of the universe, that's absolutely cardinal in Mahayana Buddhism. The idea that love is the power of the universe, and um, more powerful, and that love is more powerful than egotism and evil and hatred and violence and so forth. And um, so then in the guru thing, though, and then the, in general, though, in the history of Buddhism, the teacher relationship was, was they tried to control against the patriarchal authority figure in the family. And so they translated the guru in a little bit different way. The Indian word guru means heavy, like a heavy person, like, you know, heavy dad on the head of the person. And yes, you could love that authority who had, had control over you or you had to be obedient to. But Buddhism rejected the obedience as a major thing. Buddhist monasticism did not make obedience a, a primary virtue at all because they were always aware that the individual is going to have to come to a new understanding in order to be free of suffering. They couldn't just believe in somebody else. But then what Dan is talking about with the esoteric level of Buddhism, and there's an initiatory side to it, and then the guru thing came back where the, the teacher represents what you wish to attain and then sort of puts you in a position where you have to try to be a teacher yourself or you have to rise to the same thing. So, so you have to feel that that teacher has the qualities that you want. And even they're, even they're aware that sometimes the teacher doesn't have the qualities that you want, that the teacher is an imperfect vessel. And then, but then you associate the teacher with like mom and dad Buddha here or something. And you say he becomes a vehicle or a channel for that, that energy to come to you. One thing about his songs, the Dalai Lama, that always blows my mind, and it, and it sort of really clicked in my head only about five, six years ago, because as I say, I'm a very slow learner, still learning, <laughs> but, but something clicked. He was giving a lecture in Switzerland to about 10,000 people. And he brought up this famous verse where the Buddha says uh, to, his, um, to his monk audience, he says, the wise people accept what I say to them uh, after testing it and, and chewing on it and reasoning about it and measuring it in their experience. And then after that, they might accept it. Like a goldsmith only buys the gold after melting it and cutting it and rubbing it on a touchstone and not just says, okay, that's gold. And then, and so, and so don't just do it because you think I'm Buddha and I'm sort of cute and you should follow what I say. And then the Dalai Lama leaned forward on that throne that the Tibetans have, like a teaching throne. And he leaned like this and he said, I can just see Shakyamuni Buddha begging his students to stand up for their own minds and take whatever Buddha says and don't just say, oh, Buddha said so, but really, really make it their mm. own by, by thinking through it and seeing how it fits with their experience. So, he, so the body language that he adopted was that of a servant, of the, the teacher. And he's often said that. He said, I don't want to hear, he said, about this teacher or that is the reincarnation of so-and-so. I don't even like to hear that I'm a reincarnation of so-and-so. He said, that's all nonsense. 
He said, the only thing that validates a teacher is the progress of the student. If they benefit the student, then that's a good teacher. They can have any pedigree, any certification from this Zen center or that Lama or the other and be oppressive and be sort of acting like I'm an important guru and you should worship me and then that's not good. They won't be helpful to the student. So there is that strand, that is the strongest strand actually in Buddhism. It's throwing the responsibility back on us. And it reminds me, uh, you know, I was, I was, I loved the Dalai Lama's Templeton Prize speech. Oh, yes. And he, you know, besides the fact that he gave all the prize money away right away, 200 grand to the science dialogue people and 1,500,000 to Save the Children Foundation in England for malnourished children in India, which was his total prize. He, he gave it, in fact, he could hardly be restrained before having an acceptance speech. He was trying to like write the check. <laughs> and uh, his secretaries were like, no, 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 you hold it here. Okay, I have it here in the briefcase. You can announce it. First give an ex a reception speech. <laughs> but one of the main gist of his acceptance speech to the thousand people or so, whoever they were in the audience, he kept saying, it's nice that you're here. Thank you for coming. Nice you're here congratulating uh, this, me for this, and it's really good. But you know what? You cannot depend on any, some, so, somebody who you think is a great person to save this world. You have to do something yourself. You have to save the world. I can't save the world, he said. You know, no one person can save the world. But, you, but each, all of us together, we all act, that's, we can save the world. That's so the he, force he for really good. really is like that. You know? It's an He's, aggregate. What? It's an aggregate, all yeah. of us. He steps out of the idea of I'm a big shot, in other words. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like that. And he doesn't like the lamas even, or others who go around like, oh, well, I should be wearing like brocade and like I'm special and you know, people have to bow down to me and stuff. But there is a ritual bowing down to the guru in a ritual setting, which is an important thing, you know. Uh, you know but, uh, or bowing down to Mother Earth is an important thing. But, but um, he's, he's against like getting rigidly stuck in that, you know. And it's dangerous. We've seen a lot of gurus abusing that, haven't we, in history, in the recent history. But we shouldn't throw it out. It's very important. It's very important in a certain type of moment to have a trusted mentor, as I, like, I prefer to call it, you know, who makes a model for you of where you're trying to go. And, uh, and that's really good. You know. But it does say you want to do due diligence. What's that? You know the phrase due diligence? Yeah, check, yeah, check it out right. before yes. you. Yeah. Yes, and and they have a thing in 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 Tibet, you know, and in India, they have a thing called uh, teacher reliance or guru reliance, Lama reliance, and the, and of the reliance, the being respectful and this being uh, uh, being respectful and generous to the teacher are two factors, but they're minor factors. The main way of of honoring your teacher is to realize the teaching yourself and embody it in your life. That's what the teacher, a good teacher wants. They, they don't want just to hear and come and worship me. They want you to be, uh, be, be a teacher yourself, you know, I think. Okay, okay. Dalai Lama's really like that. That's great. We had a question on the back yes. there. Uh, sir, on the mic. Sir? Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> I think that gentleman uh, oh, in the oh, red thanks. shirt. Yes. Oh, hi. Who has the question? You had the, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Is it on? It yep. works. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> my question is for both of you, and I noticed something during the, during the conversation. One is that we have this beautiful picture on Dr. Thurman's book uh, done by Alex Gray, yes. which is this really vivid uh, you know, ver uh, uh, visualization of the quantum entanglement yes. of human consciousness. Yes. Um, Dan, you mentioned that in your upcoming book, the title is Altered Traits which clearly is a play on words of Altered States, the 1981 movie with William Hurt that addressed uh, ayahuasca, this very powerful uh, psychedelic entheogen that's being used traditionally in Peruvian uh, shaman uh, ceremonies. Now, here's the question is because oh, entheogenic uh, medicine, psychedelic medicine, if you choose to call it that, lends itself very well both to the sort of iconography that we have in the uh, tankas and can lend itself very well to the visualization techniques that we have in, within, for instance, Vajrayana. What's both of your feelings about so-called psychedelic Buddhists? Alex Gray is a self-described uh, 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 psychedelic Buddhist, along with folks like Alan Badiner at um, uh, uh, Tricycle, just came out with the book, both of them both came out with this book, Zigzag Zen, about a year ago. 
How do you guys feel about psychedelic or entheogenic Buddhists? Um, I'll start, and then I'm going to take a break. <laughs> I know you, you have a lot to say. Oh, no. uh, so um, it's interesting. I, I went to India on a pre-doctoral traveling fellowship from Harvard. I was in the department that five years before had expelled Larry and Alpert. So, you know, they're still echoing in the halls. Uh, I think that uh, in those days, psychedelics was a very useful kind of eye and mind opener. And, uh, you know, I became very close friends with Alpert, who became Ramdas. I actually was in India with him. Mm -hmm. And I met mm -hmm. Bob in the first time in a tea shop in 1970 something. Something like that, yes. In a little town in the Himalayas. Or three. I was with Ramdas and a group of friends. And you were with your family. You were living right. up in Almora. And uh, Ramdas, who's interesting, uh, who was a big proponent of psychedelics, as you know, uh, was in India to, s to explore if there were alternate routes to the same thing. And the reason we called our book Altered Traits, it was a play on altered states, uh, was because uh, we had the sense that when you took a substance, you had a wonderful experience or a horrible experience, depending, uh, and it ended when the substance left your body. And altered traits, which were the result of uh, training the brain and strengthening certain circuits and weakening others, what's called neuroplasticity, in other words, a systemic neuroplasticity mm -hmm. would, could lead to a sustained positive state. And that's really what the, the book is about. Having said that, I'm going to take another break. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I remember attending, a, when I was a graduate student at, in Cambridge in the late 60s, I attended a talk on Brattle Street by a psychi psychiatrist who had been doing psychedelic research at Austin Riggs in Massachusetts a few years before. And it was a really anti-Tim Leary talk, Leary and Alpert talk. Uh, because he was so upset that there, once they broke from Harvard, you know, the whole thing went down, that they had to leave, and they popularized the psychedelic movement. Um, they, the people who were doing research with, you know, artistic people, all kinds of complicated things, they were no longer able to do that because it was put as a Schedule One drug and the government all went berserk. And also the CIA realized that psychedelics wouldn't help soldiers become super killers it would make them into pussycats. <laughs> so it wasn't useful to the military. So, so then it all banned and all this research. And he would told a very moving story about how uh, an autistic woman who had been brought to him at her absolute end where she wouldn't metabolize glucose and was dying and was sort of chained to her bed because she would beat on herself if her, you know. Uh, he had psychedelic therapy with, with her and she got much, much better. And, and then he suddenly couldn't get to his files. He was kicked out of his office. He couldn't have any more relationship with his patients. And he was very distressed. So he was very mad about the popularization and then the backlash, you know. And now there is a new thing, like John Hopkins is using psilocybin for epilepsy. And uh, people in California are using um, MDMA and other things for PTSD and troops and soldiers and all kinds of things. And some of it is good, it doesn't always work, but it's something that can be worked with and it's the sort of technical thing that's useful to work with. The Tibetans don't actually really do that, you know. In Bhutan, there's a tremendous amount of pot that grows there and they feed it to the pigs and they don't smoke it. <laughs> uh, but they do like pork, actually, so maybe it's coming through to them. <laughs> the Bhutanese, that's the Bhutanese, but that doesn't grow higher in the altitude in Tibet. And uh, they don't have it really much. There are some ancient Indian texts that they've been translated talking about the 18 special elixirs of the, of the Siddhas, the adepts, but there's not quite clear what that is, you know. It's not, it was never a big thing actually because the meditative disciplines, as Dan was saying, the retraining of the nervous system and the mind, the power of the mind is such that you're, you know, the best drug is an enlightened and compassionate mind. And that will really change your uh, chemistry, actually. It does really change your chemistry in a, in a very secure way, where it's stable and it's, and it's uh, rerouted. And I like his thing about traits, although it took me 10 times to, to hear it with my bad hearing aid. You know, altered traits. That's very, very good. I agree with that. But it is coming back to research into it, and I think it could be useful. But, you know, I don't think it is a replacement for 10,000 hours of meditating on compassion. But 
people in the spiritual movements, Hinduism, Buddhism, yoga, and everything, they, and Ramdas himself, you know, for example, he became what he became, partly also he learned something from it. And the people, and whereas Leary, he kept saying it was just the drug because he was stuck as a materialist ideologically. And he thought just whatever you take, just take enough of it. That was his theory. And he, and he avoided this, he didn't get to the spirituality of it himself, sadly, the Leary. But Alpert did, and he didn't need the drug anymore. But in a way, you know, there, there was, because it was illegal, different, a lot of the leaders of the, Buddhist and Hindu yoga movements, they, the door was open for them, the doors of perception, like Aldous Huxley's book, by some psychedelic experimentation, and the ones who succeeded didn't keep just doing that. And then they decided, I'm going to go find out how the nervous system works, and I'm going to go find out what the yoga is, and then, and I'm not going to depend on this thing. And that, right? I believe you could say that. But there was a, there's a little tendency to obscure its role in this because we're just spiritual and we don't need that. But actually, they did need it. Well, it, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Point. So I was there the day Ramdas gave three tabs of acid to Ninkrola. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ninkrola, yeah. yeah. Uh, because he and wanted to... In those days, it was powerful Sandoz acid. It was Owsley acid, actually. Oh, was it really? Well, yeah. that was powerful, that too. That was powerful. <laughs> so uh, it was interesting. We were with him all afternoon. He didn't seem to change. In other words, he, he just was just like he always was. Instead of being like, oh, he's on a trip. He's, yeah, that's what converted. Uh, and he, what he's, and you know, Ron Doss interpreted that as he's already there, wherever there is. But he did say, <laughs> you know, in the old days, ancient days, yogis had something like this in the Himalayas. They're magic mushrooms. Yeah. And they had a way of using them Soma, in yeah, their sure. uh, practice, in their sadhana. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, this can be useful. It's not necessary, but it can be useful. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. That's a great story. Yes, another question. Oh, okay. oh. Hi. Um, hi. This is a, a question about compassion. Uh, it's. Oh. <laughs> yes. I ring the bell okay. at that. Yes. Yeah, it right. does. Yeah. yeah. It, I was rang a, I did it. it rang a real bell for me because uh, when you talk about toddlers and toddlers and how they're compassionate and then they, they change and, and they're being taught now. Um, it's a form of emotional intelligence, isn't it? I mean, that's your sure. background. Um, what I'm wondering is, as well as teaching them to be compassionate to others, I am going to assume that you're going to emphasize that the first person they need to be compassionate to is themselves. Because with children, often they come into this world quite optimistic and then they get knocked and they get told that they should be nice to other people and i guess i'm talking from personal experience because my life has been a journey of sure. learning to be compassionate to myself sure. uh -huh. so i would assume that if we're going to emphasizing and there's a lot of mindfulness in schools um if we're going to emphasize to children that they should be compassionate to everyone else sure. they have to have that robust background of self-compassion so uh, <laughs> It was actually in that dialogue with the Dalai Lama in uh, Newport Beach, just mm -hmm. before he won the Nobel, mm -hmm. uh, that Sharon Salzberg uh, told the Dalai Lama, you know, there are people that don't like themselves in the West. He was shocked. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, you need a, a word in English, uh, which is self-compassion. In my language, Tibetan and in mm -hmm. Sanskrit, compassion implies yourself. It's part of what we mean by compassion. He said, only here, he didn't say this, but mm -hmm. only here do we have this dichotomy. Yeah. The compassion is, you know, sacrificing self for others, but actually the original root meaning uh, in, in Eurasian cultures is that yourself is included. And now there's uh, literature on self-compassion, psychological literature. And uh, of course, is all, all I have to say, really. Yes. Uh, yes, I think, uh um, I, I think I'm still learning, but it took me 40 years or more her to realize that what they talk about as um, renunciation in Buddhism is actually self-compassion. In other words, it's uh, caring for yourself by restraining yourself from doing things that are harmful to you that you're attracted to, like drinking pound, like three gallons of Coca-Cola every day, you know, and becoming diabetic at 16 and this kind of thing. And uh, so actually, you know, 
being self-sacrificing in the sense about not indulging in, in just your immediate desires is a kind of beginning of self-compassion. And uh, that's considered foundational in the Buddhist path to being able to have compassion for others. And because by doing, by self-restraint, you will find your own happiness, actually. And you realize that you know, following the dictate of your culture, I should go be a soldier and kill people. I should like have six children when I'm 13 and be a productive mother. I should do whatever it is, which are all kinds of harsh things to, to, to the people to make themselves unhappy about. If, you, if you, you renounce those kind of things, which the culture tells you are great things for, your, for you, but by being able to be detached from them, you start to feel better and you start to feel happier. And then once you feel happy and you look at the other people and you see that guy who just did drink three gallons of Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola every day is like <laughs> sitting around like this and they're about to have their toes amputated at 22. And then you, then you feel compassion for them. So there has to be a degree of happiness in yourself to have true compassion. Otherwise there is a concept in Buddhism called sentimental compassion, which is sort of like pity maybe of like, but it's a kind of, it has no force. It has no energy, and it's kind of, it's a, it's kind of um, condescending because it goes along with an attitude that there's nothing that can be done about this person's suffering. Whereas compassion is, can only come from a heart that is feeling better, has a little bit of a feeling of release in it, and then sees this person very constricted by this and that difficulty, and then knows that they could be free of it, and therefore will do something to try to help them become free of it. So. <clears throat> The whole thing, that's why I like Dan's phrase so much, muscular compassion. Because we are stuck with the wrong attitude that if you're compassionate, you'll be a doormat and you'll be beaten up and you'll be a martyr. And it, you know, you, you know, you're just sort of throwing yourself under the tank, under the bus, and you know, they, say, they would say. But that's not how it's understood there at all. It's, a, it's understood as a, as a muscular thing where you are actually, you're broadening your field and in a way, one thing we have to recognize is all of these teachings traditionally are in all these male chauvinist societies. Buddha was not one. He was completely equal about everything. And, uh, and the monasticism, female as well as male, was a revolutionary thing in his culture at the time. It wasn't allowed in the West at all, or in China at all at that time, and then at the Buddha's time. And five or six hundred years later, maybe in East Asia and West Asia, it started out a little bit of monasticism. And those things are somehow misunderstood as somehow anti this and that, anti body, people can say, but it, they aren't. They're into, and, and, and the Buddha was a little worried about female monasticism because, only because he knew there would be such a stampede of the young women to get out of the horrible persecution within the fa patriarchal family system where they were started to be forced to be pregnant at thir at the, right after puberty and by 20 they'd had seven childbirths and they were kind of worn out by 25. And then, so, hey, the, and they were married to somebody they didn't care about, some family arrangement, and uh, not have children, not have a little Saturday night with the old character. Oh no, I want to go be a nun. Oh yes, I'm going to have my <laughs> sensuality in meditation. That'll be great. And, and there are these songs of the nuns where they say, oh Buddha, you're so great. I love you, you saved me. If, I, if this is not nirvana, it's close enough. You saved me from three crooked things. My bent over, no, my bent rice pestle, rice pounding pestle, you know, kitchen equipment. My bent over old mother-in-law and my hunchback husband. <laughs> and I'm happy, I just had food, somebody prepared it to me, they gave it to me free. I have a one bowl and I don't have to wash the dishes. And uh, I'm meditating under a tree here. That's really cool. So, so we have to remember that, you know. And the ma, in a way, we all, right, oxytocin as opposed to cortisol. Under stress, the female tends to release oxytocin in the nervous system, right, which is looking around you at your environment. And that's, in one, in one way, that's what compassion is. It's environmental awareness. It's like, where do I have an ally? How can I deal with this, this problem that's coming at me, which is usually a man, <laughs> or, or, or triggered by them. And, uh, and, so they, and so that's, you know, someone asked me once, you know, I had this theory of cool heroism in my inner revolution book. And some would say, well, where's all the cool heroes? Where are they? I don't see any, you know, like. And then I was thinking to myself, well, they, well, I can say the Dalai Lama, I can say my old teacher, I can say this. And I'm like, typical male, I'm like stuck here, you know. And I suddenly thought of a family squabble. Brother and brother, 
father and son, something like that. And who gets in the middle of them and makes the, holds the family together? The cruel hero. Oh no, dear, you didn't mean it. Oh, apologize. Oh no, don't just hate each other. And then bang, she gets banged in between. You know? And so we, the cool heroes are the female. And they also don't like the wars, really. Even they, Hillary pretended to just to try to get elected by these weird rednecks in our country, people like me. And <laughs> they don't really like it. They don't want their children killed. You know, they've been, you know, that's an th ancient theme in history. But the family, nuclear family, cannot withstand a militarized government. They can't. But monastics, they did. And uh, so we're now, again, that's another thing. We're, we're not only in an era where war no longer works, once war no longer works, then the boys making a mess is no longer tolerable. And so, you know, we got cheated out of our mom president, but there'll be one coming along pretty soon when we see a weird dad like that. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for two <laughs> extremely quick any questions. Names. I think you have the mic and then, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, what's your turn? Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And I wanted to call out Robert your socks. Um, What's that? I wanted to call out your socks. I wanted. I'm very grateful for your socks. Oh my today. socks! Um, oh. Be, I'm not sure if you know what They're today is. They're called happy socks. They're definitely happy socks. <laughs> but today is actually the International Day of Love as well. So I wanted to. Today is. Today is. Oh, so right. those socks oh, wonderful. are yeah. are very very okay. fitting. One yeah. of my sons gave them to me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and then people realized that I like these happy socks, and I got so many happy socks. I really have. Some of them are a little cuckoo. It's, it's, nice. a good, it's a good it's ritual a to start the nice. day. Put your happy socks Thank on. You. Um, Thank you. So the, the question I have is, who, what groups of people need to start to be opened up to this message of the Dalai Lama and compassion, and how do we make them listen? What groups of people are going to have the biggest impact to get to that 2021? Um, is, it, is it the police force? Is it you know, kindergarten kids? Is it um, you know, uh, business leaders around the world? Who, who isn't listening that needs to listen, and how do we get them to listen in both of your kind of experiences? I, I think it can work out. Uh, you know, I think everybody, the group, there's no one particular group of people. I'd say the same. I think everybody, there's some way in which there's something for everybody out of compassion. Because the human being needs compassion, as the Halama is constantly saying. Every, you know, kindness of strangers, every baby in every household, even the embryo, is receiving kindness of strangers because she doesn't know who that is at first. Some guy is like taking up, is occupying the womb who they don't, or some girl who they don't know who it is. But who's, who's and, the and so, and then, the, then you have, they have to take care of us and we're helpless for how long? Years, decades, like nowadays, maybe three or four decades. So, <laughs> so he's, uh, Bob said everybody. everybody yeah. yeah, I think maybe even uh, those of us who think we are listening could probably do a little better. I'm sorry, wait, who, who, uh, Everybody could yeah. listen to the message. Sure. Of and what, what His Holiness says in uh, Force for Good is that it's really up to each one of us finding what we can do, what distinct ability, yes. capability, leverage, influence we may have, and then doing it. That's, that's the compassion in action. Yes. Yeah. Actually, there was a great moment, Dan, in our peacemaking conference in San Francisco that you referred to where the Dalai Lama was going on like he does. The youth, you know, you know we, we were all old folks, we were all finished, you, know, you guys were up to you, because we had, we had these 500 youth at risk, or 1,000, I think, from all different inner cities and reform schools and things in this great conference right. that Dan helped us, and we all worked together on, Dan and I, and, uh, and our wives, of course, and uh, who really did all the main work, as usual. But, uh, he, so his only said, said that, okay? And then everyone was going, yeah, yes, the young people. And then this Jean Shinoda Bolin, this psychologist, she sort of piped up, she held up her hand, and she was on stage, and we had these different groups that would be on stage at different times, and a famous Jungian psychologist. And she said, uh, excuse me, um, uh, but in a lull, you know, and then we recognized her, and then she said, well, you know, Your Holiness, I think there's one source of energy to change the world in a positive way that Your His Holiness may be overlooking. And so, in this thing about the youth are gonna do it, and so then people are going, well, what is that? And someone is just like, well, what is that? And she said, menopausal zest. <laughs> <laughs> this is a California audience. Remember that? California audience has brought the house down. <laughs> Two, three, four thousand people, whatever it was, in the Bill Graham Civic Center. They just all went nuts. 
And his Holiness is asking from St. Jumbar, like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he doesn't know the word, I think. <laughs> and he liked the idea. He, but the zest thing, he wasn't quite sure about that, but he really liked it. So I think he, anyway, I don't know. Wasn't that fun? Remember that? That was wonderful. That was a great moment. <laughs> okay, on that note, we'll go okay. to our very last question. Last question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. what I guess was a misperception of, um, or maybe an idealization of the Tibetan culture. Because so much of what I read about Buddhism um, relied upon the kind of common idea that of, of this unconditional mother love that you could use as a frame of reference. And a lot of, not just Americans, but a lot of grew up where that family structure was not intact. And I studied the neurophysiology of child abuse. Oh. So when we're talking about compassion, you know, I had to kind of kind of skirt around to a place where I could see that with a cooler eye because, um, you know, when a child is raised in an environment where there's danger, they learn to read mommy and daddy really well. Because knowing that mommy's pissed off, you shut up, you don't cry. You, you learn to get those signals because your life depends on it. And that can be overt or can be subtle. But when you come up to something like learning compassion, and we're talking about intuiting what other people are thinking, a lot of that baggage comes with it. And a lot of the frame of reference that um, Tibetan Buddhism and maybe Buddhism in general is built on that, you know, that there are these common, you know, that, that, though, that when you're talking about compassion, you already have self-respect. You already have an intact sense of self. You're not coming at it from the um, ruptured back environment that the fundamentals of your sense of self and your sense of what it is to assist and love are whole and quote normal according to that structure and I've often wished that there was like a translation process you know between what I read about compassion so that I could hear it without having to retranslate it for myself you know like this is not about, and it does come into that doormat thing. Why do people say when you, you, know, you talk about compassion, well, I'm going to be a doormat. Because that is sort of by default what a lot of people with that background are going to do. They're going to have to like kind of step themselves back from it and go, wait a minute, that wasn't what I was supposed to do. But it, they may not successfully be able to do that, engage in a way that is fulfilling growth, is fulfilling where we want to go and not where we don't want to go. And um, it doesn't surprise me here at the Dalai Lama for some of these concepts that, you know, some people aren't born liking themselves or aren't born with that. It surprises them. So one thing, and this may be a very naive question, but is the Tibetan culture much more stable in a family sense than your experience of American families? Is this, is this a given? Is this something that there is not, you know, that children are brought up in safe environments and they don't have that risk? They don't um, fend for themselves early. There isn't child abuse. There isn't... Um, there's a stability in the way children are brought up that they can mature properly. I sort of properly. lost track of the question. I'm so sorry. the question is, if I could paraphrase, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. is there, is Tibetan, does Tibetan culture raise children in a way where they're less damaged than I the West? I think so. Uh, yeah, I think so. And then that was the reason for the lack. I mean, actually, it's not true that Tibetan psychology and Tibetan is unaware of the possibility of self-loathing. They're quite aware of it, and they have terms for it, actually. That was just a thing people thought that because Dalai Lama was puzzled about it in that the conversation with Sharon. Um, and um, there is, you know, the, the wish to extinguish yourself is a very powerful one that, that um, leads to addiction and leads to suicide. And it's, it's very well known in India and Tibet, totally. But uh, I think the thing is that, the, you know, my old Mongolian geishe, uh, my original teacher, he used to say this thing. He used to say, brothers, in a culture like this, I think what he was referring to kind of nuclear family, they often don't get along. But one of the reasons they do get along in a place like Tibet or Mongolia is they need each other. They're working on a farm, they're defending against wolves, they, are, you know, they need more manpower, woman power, they need the members of the family to deal with the environment you know, in sort of more, more sort of old fashioned type of society. And whereas in the kind of capitalist one, you don't really need them, so it's a matter that, you know, siblings tend to compete just to get more ice cream and so forth, and they, do, they don't do any chores mostly in most families, you know, middle class ones anyway. And so 
I think that's a practical thing like that, if that's what you're talking about. I, I, I'm sorry, but I couldn't quite follow your description of the Tibetan uh, family. It was actually Tibetan the, family yeah. is, you know, on the first, on the one hand, you can see monasticism itself as a sort of the original family abuse intervention institution, because the female could escape once they was men, female monasticism, they could escape from the oppression of the patriarchal extended family system. The male could escape from war and you know, labor and so forth in a certain way. And, um, and so people, you know, family suddenly had, the, had, there was an escape zone from the family in those societies where this slowly spread. And that's why the escape from authority, that's why monasticism was not tolerated in the Roman Empire, et cetera, until very, very late. You know, in Buddha's time, uh, there was no such toleration in West Asia, you know, the desert areas around the Mediterranean. There was no such, uh, you know, thing in China either. They, the Confucians, they were, they, they were really terrified of Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns. But then it became huge in China, monasticism. And so, so the Tibetan society was unusual in that 10 to 15 percent were monastic, which had a very healthy effect on the population growth, actually. It helped control it. But then within the family, they were very relaxed. It was one of the few cultures where you had polyandry, where one woman would marry two or three brothers, and the brothers wouldn't kill each other because they, they didn't want to divide the land you know, between in the, within the, the different you know, heirs of the father or the parents. And uh, you also had some polygamy, but they had a thing like one woman, one house. So they, if, you, if you were very wealthy and you traveled and far away, you could have another household in another place. And they were kind of relaxed on those scores. They weren't puritanical and weird and crazy about things. They were very kind of relaxed about them. And uh, so they were more affectionate and naturally healthy. They were actually a little too rough, my teacher used to say, a little too rough with the young monks. You know, the discipline about memorizing was just a little too harsh. And maybe they could be, but the young kids were needed right away in the, like the nomad families to go out and watch the goats or the yaks or whatever. And it's not easy to watch a yak. Yaks are kind of very independent minded, the yaks, you know. There's, there's uh, another analysis that's that? relevant. There's another analysis that's relevant, and that's yes. the work of Hazel Marcus at Michigan. Who's that? I'm sorry. Hazel Marcus is, yeah. a, I think, a social psychologist. She, yeah. she looks at Asian cultures and Western cultures in terms of the self. She says there's more group self in Asia, where you identify more of an open a group. Self? Group. Oh, you're, group you're self. Part, you identify first as part of your group, my family, whatever. Uh, and the extended family is very strong yes. too in most Asian societies. In the West, uh, it, it's very individualistic. And individu the, the problem of indiv one of the problems of individualism uh, is it's me first. And another is that the family system breaks down. People move away, they divorce, they alcoholic, whatever. Those problems, um, you know, for children, can, at, at the level of being a child of someone in that system, can be very damaging. So I think the bottom line is that there tends to be more such psychological damage in the West than in traditional Asian cultures. So that's nice. I don't know if we got to the root. You were act thinking like there might be a little danger in compassion. Is that, I heard the word danger. It, it, it's not, it, uh, the danger is not in compassion. It's in uh, the translation um, of what compassion means when oh. you come from a background where those definitions are pretty murky and compassion means, you know, reading somebody else's mind so they don't kill you. You know, it's, it's not, you know, or reading your mind because you might hurt me and if I don't know what you're thinking, I might say the wrong thing as opposed okay. to I'm genuinely there for you, and a, you know, a real definition of compassion. Right. Um, and it's you know, trans translating what are good concepts past you know, one's psychological baggage. Okay. Well, well I, don't, I don't mean to provoke you to uh, explain too much, but I'm just saying that uh, have we passed the danger a little bit? I'm just making it go. I mean, are we past the danger? I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not oh, well, I, it must be my hearing. I can't hear exactly. Have we moved past the danger? Oh, to me personally? No, 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 just in our discussion. Yes, oh, no, I, my question is that was so okay. Thank you. Okay, right. great. All right, we, we just have a little bit of <laughs> housekeeping. Um, I yes, really, I really want thank to you so much. Oh, no, no, thank you. You, you have some final comments. I do, I have a are few. Are you going to grade us? <laughs> C plus. <laughs>
C plus, D minus, A. <laughs> uh, He's um, great. I just want to encourage everyone, please, to go out. It, you, until you look inside that book, you won't realize what I'm saying, but it is absolutely stunning. Oh, yeah, Man it's really piece, great. The it's a comic book. life story of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Action. It's, it's, a, it's a graphic biography, I believe we call it. Um, and it is a, a harrowing story. It's a very difficult story, but it's underscored with a lot of purpose and a lot of hope in the end. And uh, please check it out. And also pick up Man of Peace. The, uh, sorry. Pick up... Force for good. good. The Dalai Lama's we have a bunch of world. Oh, by, uh, and Lowe. mention the website, which is Force for Good with the number four instead of the word for. Right. Force for Good. Yes. Uh, dot, dot net. Yes. Oh, great. Great. Wonderful. And Thanks. if you need something to do on the subway, uh, check out the Meditate This podcast uh, as well if you're interested. And please thank both of these gentlemen for me. Their time and their time. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.